Welcome to Great Power Politics. In today's class, we are talking about the relationship between Japan and China and the competition in, the, uh, in East Asia. Um, I think this is a specifically interesting topic because it has quite a lot of dimension which we can look at. At the one hand, we have uh, a certain uh, conflict uh, between the two countries due to his, the historic context, but also uh, territorial disputes like the Daesh or the Sengaku Islands uh, dispute between the two countries. At the other end, we have a high level of economic dependency between the two countries and their biggest trading partners uh, in the region. Um, Another really interesting dimension uh, in this discussion is the geopolitical perspective. Um, as we have heard before, is the, uh, China is the number one rising power within the region, but maybe even within the world. And the US United States has in the recent years uh, um, stepped up its effort to contain um, the increased power of China. In this kind of uh, constellation, uh, Japan is a really important actor as well as a very close ally of the United States. And so we have these kind of multi-faced um, uh, dimensions um, of uh, cooperation as well as conflict uh, with, with between the countries, but also within the region. Uh, I look very much forward to um, exploring these together with you. So I hope you will enjoy this class and I will go right into the slides. Thank you. Okay. So the, the title, of course, of, the, um, of today's class is The Future Challenge, Japan and China Competing and Beyond. So this sounds like a little bit of a cryptic uh, uh, title, um, but what I want to say with this is not just looking at specific kind of military conflictual situations between China and Japan, but rather looking a little bit at this uh, relationship, which is, has been challenged in, in, in recent years. And um, kind of, it is a very interesting situation where there is a certain level of dependency as, um, as well as conflict, uh, pot uh, potential conflict uh, included. Um, so we will have a look a little bit around um, the origins of this, um, uh, the conflict, um, but also where there is cooperation and what kind of dependency is on the on the different uh, from the different sides. Okay, so you probably have seen this um, quite um, quite a lot. There is uh, one key area of um, of conflict between China and the neighboring countries is around the South China Sea. So the South China Sea, as you see here in, in this region, has many claims um, by by several um, countries. So you see the the red line um, on this on this um, uh, graph um, shows the what uh, what China is actually feeling that it should be part of its own territory. That's more or less all of the South China Sea. And there are competing claims with this uh, from Taiwan, which is also seen as, um, by, by the Chinese government as part, of, um, as part of China, but also by the Philippines, by Vietnam, by Malaysia, and in one specific instance, also by Japan. So this is what you call the Daesh uh, Sengaku Islands, um, which are um, in the on this graph. If you see in the furthest north uh, um, and part um, of the territory, and this has kind of created um, tension in the in the last couple of years between China and Japan. Um, it is belonging to uh, uh, to Japan, um, and but if um, it continues to be a disputed area. Um, and is one of the key sources of, of conflict between um, the two countries. So we do have um, territorial conflict between China and uh, and Japan, but um, maybe not as may as, um, as large a conflict, a territorial conflict, as is between other neighboring countries and China. The one issue which makes it quite different is that China, uh, that Japan 
is, is also seen as a, maybe the second most powerful country within the region and therefore has a, um, the potential of escalation is uh, much more severe um, than it is, let's say, with countries like Vietnam or maybe even um, uh, the Philippines. So what do we want to talk about today? Um, so basically, we want to talk a little bit about the major powers in the region, which are more or less the US, Japan, and of course, China. Um, but then also we want to talk about new challenges. What kind of challenges are coming up? Uh, and what is, um, are these um, territorial uh, uh, national security threats? Are these the only threats which are, which are existent? Um, or are there other issues? And as you see on the slide already below, um, I mentioned a couple of, uh, of different ones. Here we have, um, under the head of international security, we can talk about um, uh, also issues like human security, which includes counterterrorism, environmental protection, health-related issues. As we experience at the moment, the pan uh, COVID-19 pandemic is really falling into this issue of international security as well. Um, so these are non-traditional forms of uh, security which seem to become more and more important in different kind of mechanisms are working on, uh, on, on these kind of issues. Why? Because um, it's not necessarily sufficient for a country um, to, um, to solely protect its citizens um, by, um, by being uh, um, uh, equipped for any kind of intrusion or being equipped for any kind of aggression from abroad. What is much more important is that there is an international um, effort to tackle uh, tackle such, uh, uh, such challenges. And that needs cooperation rather than conflictual behavior. But we will talk about this um, just in a minute. So um, if we talked about uh, the major powers in the region, the ones, uh, have a think about it. Who would you think um, is one of, uh, are the major powers? Well, it's China obviously is, uh, is uh, politically, economically, but also militarily a very influential actor within the region on, or even on the global stage. Um, as the second, as I said already, uh, before uh, the, the key role of Japan is also that it is, um, politically, economically, and to some extent also militarily, um, one of the most powerful actors in the region. And therefore, these two are maybe the obvious choices to say, like, these are the major powers um, which will kind of decide um, the key issues within this region. But you might be surprised <clears throat> that most experts would actually list above all um, the United States as a key player in this region. Um, so the reason for that is that actually a lot of the current security structure um, of um, East Asia is built on the cooperation with the United States. What do we mean by this? Well, we are all familiar uh, with, the, with the security arrangement between Japan and the United States. So in order to, uh, for, for Japan um, to, be, um, to be secure, it heavily relies on the cooperation with the United States being protected by the United States. On a, this is a bilateral agreement between those, both countries. And both, um, and this kind of, the, the whole structure, how the, the military um, uh, of the, uh, um, the Japanese military, so the, the defense forces um, are, are built up, is really kind of under the premises that the United States will, um, will actively protect uh, Japan from any harm uh, taken. This is not, but Japan is not the only country which is heavily relying on the U.S. in its, its kind of security structure. The most notable other area within the region is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is uh, not formally recognized as independent of uh, China, uh, but at the same time de facto acting as an independent state, uh, also with some military capacity. But the only way it can successfully um, um, defend itself against aggression, let's say from the 
the People's Republic of China or, uh, or other actors, is by its kind of close cooperation with the United uh, with the United States, uh, which um, which um, stated uh, several times that it will uh, not tolerate any action, military action against um, the island. Other kind of close allies of the United States, or at least um, historically close allies of the United States, is South Korea, as well as um, the Philippines. Um, so many of the countries, uh, of the regions, um, bigger countries, are actually closely aligned with the United States, but not just allies. Their security kind of concepts rely on the presence of uh, the United States in the region, and therefore, de facto, the United States is the biggest security provider within the region, and also the one, the, maybe the key major player um, in this area. So we do have China, which is the only, the, which is of course a kind of not relying on the United States, um, but most of the other um, bigger um, actors are relying on the United States. As their, as their key ally. <clears throat> well, the interesting thing, um, if you go back uh, to thinking about uh, about our um, our first classes on on theoretical concepts of stability, one thing we learned there was that um, changes in the power structure are leading, according to realist theories, are leading to instability on a global level. Why was that the case? Hmm. You might remember that actually, um, this is because um, if one country, or one region becomes more powerful, other countries uh, subsequently have to become less powerful. And this kind of shift change in the international system leads to tension and friction. And these kind of frictions can then escalate into uh, into stronger conflict and in the worst case actually into military conflict. So if we kind of look at the at the regions uh, um, and the growth structure on a global perspective, what we can see is that that um, uh, China and East Asia more generally um, ex um, had had a very long run in in uh, economic growth and became therefore economically much stronger and subsequently also uh, politically and um, militarily much stronger. So if we kind of compare two kind of economically well-performing uh, regions between the 1990s and 2019, so in the last 20 years roughly, and 30 years roughly, sorry, um, we can see that the OECD uh, economies had like a Grow, uh, capital growth GDP of 1.4% per year on average over this period of time. Um, East Asia, excluding Japan, Japan of course being included in the OECD uh, economies, um, had a, a capital growth um, of 5.8% and a much larger population. So here so we have a 0 0.9 billion people in the OECD country and uh, 1.8 billion within uh, East Asia. Excluding um, excluding Japan, so what we do see uh, on this uh, kind of figures is that there has been a power shift from the initial kind of um, most powerful countries in the, the OECD countries um, towards East Asia because the GDP growth has been continuously above the level of um, the OECD countries. So in terms of if we kind of put plug this back into our our uh, realist theories, we could kind of argue that this might be a cause for tension within the region, not necessarily like real historically grown conflict, but, but maybe this change in the in the in the power structure among the countries leads towards increased tension within the region. Um, so, also if we kind of compare a different level, and this is some this is relatively old data. So the newest one is from 2015. Um, there might be some, quite some change actually having taken place uh, within this data. But the general trend um, is, is, is definitely not changed. And that is that you can see from 1997 
um, over 2006 up to 2015, all the countries in the region had a substantial increase of their military budget. Um, uh, on a, this is on an annual basis. So we can see uh, it growing in China considerably, especially between 2006 and 2015. Um, if you, which is not included in here, if you would use newer data, you would actually see probably an even higher jump um, in the last uh, five years. But also in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea, and uh, also in India, and to some extent in Indonesia, you see the same trends going on. You see that over time, the, um, the, the military um, budget has been increased um, uh, uh, consistently. And that means that actually over all the, the military capability and therefore also uh, the, the military capacity um, has, has increased um, within the region um, over time. More weapons also, of course, uh, lead uh, to a higher level of risk um, that uh, some, some military conflict could lead to escalation. Um, this is not unusual in terms of uh, the overall uh, trend on a global scale. You could see here in Germany, it's just as a comparison in there as well, that the military budget also increased. Um, but not in not to the same extent. So we can see that actually um, that um, that within East Asia um, the the tension are more increased. So the nece the necessity by the politicians to build up the military is seen as, as as more urgent than in other regions, like for example in Europe. Um, an interesting trend what we do see here is that the United States actually decreased its military budget from two, uh, from 1997 to 2015. It was a big jump at the end of the, um, in the beginning of the 2000s um, uh, that was seen as a, as a reaction to the end of the Cold War. Um, but also even from 2006 to 2015, um, with the existence of the Iraq wars, um, there was still um, a, a reduction of the military um, budget. Having said that, as you could see here, it is on a much, much higher level than any of the countries we have been talking about uh, before. So while there has been a reduction of the budget um, in the United States, it still exceeds um, all the other actors by a long way. Uh, and therefore, it's a different trend than the rest of the, um, 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 or the, the countries in, in East Asia, um, but at, at the same time, still on a very high level. Um, one issue which I think is a little bit under, um, under noticed and is, is um, definitely not seen so much in, in the common news, etc., is a new, um, uh, what I call the Asian new security structure. What I mean with this is that not just um, the, the traditional forms of, of security in terms of um, uh, national security uh, are not um, not the only kind of forms which are which are relevant at the, at the moment, and I want to dive into this in more detail in a, in a little further. So, so if we kind of look at um, security, we are looking at a different aspect, not just the, the risk of being invaded by a foreign by a foreign country, but rather about other forms of threat. Um, I kind of summarize them as international security. Maritime security, what I mean with maritime security is um, the security of, uh, of shipping lanes and also the ship security that a smooth, um, um, a smooth trade can be done uh, transitioning between the areas without any, any kind of risk. But also human security. And what we mean with human security is um, that individual uh, the, the security of the individual is not guaranteed in all cases by the protection of the state. So, for example, human rights um, uh, might might be violated by uh, by certain state actors. Also, issues like peace, migration, environmental protection, um, counterterrorism, uh, drug trade, but also infectious diseases are all kind of aspects of. Uh, forms of security to our our livelihood 
um, which is uh, which are not um, which are not falling in this kind of traditional form of um, safety, uh, which we feel from from kind of military threats. So especially as we can see in this in this current period of the pandemic, with the COVID nineteen pandemic, we do see that in, in infectious diseases can have a a substantial um, impact on our livelihood and also our feeling of security and our well-being. So we, we found our, find on a global level, we find that um, there's a very high number uh, of uh, people diseased by this, uh, by, by this um, uh, disease, by, by COVID-19, but also a, a, a really high mortality rate in the United States already for a long time. Uh, the, the death toll of, uh, of COVID-19 exceeded any uh, death toll since, uh, of any kind of military conflict, including Vietnam, uh, since the end of the Second World War. And it seems to approach very much, actually, the, the, the loss of life um, of the United States within the Second World War. So we, if we kind of look at this, um, uh, this uh, in the light of the current pandemic, we can see um, that this kind of security is also really important. What we also do is, is that um, countries react uh, or, or governments react differently to this kind of threat and differently um, with different rates of success. Uh, it's way too early to say which countries are the ones which are dealing better uh, with, uh, with this pandemic and which are the ones which deal worse with it. But we can see some uh, certain trends and it seems that in countries where where um, the the virus has been underestimated or where the treatment has been um, badly implemented, we do see high levels of death toll um, and overproportionately high levels of death toll um, in 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 this, this country. And um, so um, I think this highlights very much that we have to have a much more broader concept of security. Um, one thing which I, I will talk about this in a little later in this in this class anyway, uh, but one thing which makes it really interesting is that um, this form of security lie um, is is relying on cooperation between countries. So if countries cooperate well, then they are more capable of fighting diseases. Um, if there is competition over, let's say. Um, 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 protective uh, gears, PPE, and, and other forms of, of, of protection, if there is kind of uh, misinformation and, and distrust, this is harmful uh, for fighting the, the, the fighting um, the disease, but not just in a local level, but on a global level. And so the mindset for this kind of conflict is very different than the mindset which we have in, in a traditional uh, confrontational uh, conflict between two countries. So I will kind of go a little bit further in this, in this slide, um, talking about this, about the nature of security. Um, so I think this is really important that we do see different forms of threat have a different nature. So in a, our traditional form of conflict between nation states, we do have states as the main, often called the main rational actor. So these actors are making a calculation about what is the benefit and the, and the cost of, um, of conflictual behavior and are act according to this. Um, in a way, this also because they are assumed to be rational actors, um, they, this um, conflictual situation can be stopped uh, or escalated depending on what kind of current situation uh, the state is in. So it's actually all based on choice rather than on, on um, circumstances. It's also seen that states are unitary actors. What do we mean by unitary actors? Well, you might recall that a unitary actor is one which is kind of can be seen as one. So if we think that nation states are unitary actors, we can say that they are not different fractions in the, uh, in, in, within the country, but rather that there is a unified decision-making process. So let's say, roughly speaking, a country gets, the country A gets attacked by country B, so country A is defending against country B. Uh, in a way, this is a unified actor because we don't make a distinction between, let's say, 
left-wing people in the country or right-wing people or young people or old people, or however, what kind of, whatever kind of uh, distinction you want to make. No, we are saying this is a, um, a state-level issue and therefore, if you are belonging to state A or JP, you have a unified perception on this kind of conflict. But uh, what we do see in recent years much more is that actors in international relations are not necessarily state actors. And very often this kind of unified actor assumption is not, uh, has not much merit. Um, to give you the very um, easy uh, assumptions, is, um, if you think about um, terrorist threats, so very often they are coming from within countries. Most of the terrorist attacks, uh, Islamist terrorist attacks, which have been carried out in, in Europe, have been done by citizens of the of the state. So within in France, on the uh, Charlie Hebdo um, uh, attacks, um, in the in the Tube attacks, in, in London as well as in in Madrid, but also um, and the attack uh, with with a with a truck in Berlin on a Christmas market. All of these have been enacted by domestic people, um, which are part of the society within the country, and therefore. We can't kind of see security in the same way as a unified actor idea because there is no outside and inside within this. Uh, this means it needs completely different approaches. Of course, within the uh, in, in, in regional and in, uh, conflict, we do have also other actors which are really important. So the, the, the general public, as I said uh, just in, in, uh, at the moment, but also non-governmental actors are often very important, like. Um, human rights groups, for example, or, um, or, or as a support group for minorities, etc. But also international organizations play, as we kind of heard in our last class, play a more and more vital role in, in mediation of international conflict. So, So in a way, what is quite interesting um, is that in, from an international security perspective, the landscape changed considerably since the Cold War. In the Cold, during the Cold War, we had basically three groups of, of actors. One was the, roughly speaking, the West under the leadership of the United States, um, um, a capitalist um, alliance, democratic alliance, um, then there was the East under the socialist uh, government and, and, uh, and, and the leadership of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, this Eastern Bloc was also kind of uh, as a coordinated and aligned uh, foreign policy as well. And then there were certain countries which were non-aligned um, to any of these, uh, very frequently in not very important areas uh, for these specific superpowers. So many of them can be found in, in African countries, but also um, in, in Southeast Asia, which has been not uh, has been more at the periphery of the of the conflict. Um, however, since the end of the Cold War, this kind of changed considerably. Initially, there was the idea that now this kind of very large scale, um, ideologically dominated conflict during the Cold War. Once this is over, we would actually kind of lead a, um, a, 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 more, a more peaceful era of um, where, where, where conflict become rarer. And uh, um, Francis Fukuyama's end of history um, uh, idea is really kind of based on this, on this notion that, um, that cooperation will be at the forefront rather than conflictual behavior. Um, but of course, we know by now that this is not how the world played out, and we see many different conflicts popping up, but often in a, from a regional perspective. Uh, and these kind of the regional conflicts, um, they can they 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 are in a multitude of of areas. We can see them, of course, in in East Asia, as we as we just talked about a, a little earlier about this, but we can also see them. Um, in, uh, in in conflict between India and and, and China between the um, between the Iran and 
and its neighbors in, in Syria, in, in many parts of the world, we do find these regional kind of conflicts. One um, rather recent development from this, the one sole superpower, the United States, is um, that is actually kind of uh, um, less willing to play a security guarantor for specific regions. So you, you remember at the beginning of this, of this class, we talked about the importance of uh, the United States as an actor within the region because um, many of the um, of the of the countries, including Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Philippines, etc., um, many of these countries are relying in their security structure on the United States. But in recent years, especially under the presidency of of uh, Donald Trump, we see a, a reduction of uh, the willingness to play this guarantor um, position. How do we see this? Well. In, um, the, of course, this in a way is embedded in, in the America first uh, policy or doctrine of, uh, um, of uh, Trump, if you, if you want to. Um, but also we do see questioning of existing security structures more publicly, demanding higher kind of um, financial uh, burden sharing at the United States call it so higher uh, financial obligations by their partners in order to keep up the current infrastructure. So in a way we see that there is a willingness um, to reduce uh, the, the, the United States involvement in many kind of conflicts in the world. Um, and so this might actually increase again um, will kind of create a, a certain level of a, of a security vacuum, uh, which other actors are, are capable of exploring. So in a way, if this comes together with the Chinese military and political power increasing in the region, um, it was seen as a, as a kind of worrying development, especially in Japan, because uh, the, the reason for that was that um, uh, the, this power structure was seen to tilt towards China as the predominant actor within the region. Uh, in a way, um, this, of course, this kind of analysis uh, is very much based on information we had before the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, which seemed, especially the initial handling of the um, of uh, the Chinese government by suppressing information which came out by, by local uh, medical staff and trying to, um, to reduce the, the consequences of it uh, or kind of making it less, the consequences less known has been seen as quite negative by several of its neighbors. And it, it remains to be seen how, how the, the Chinese response was. Uh, will be judged uh, in the long run uh, by by other countries, but there has been severe criticism raised around this very early stage. Having said that, again, um, China seemed to be one of the countries which was kind of using drastic measures at a very early uh, at a at the early stage of of the outbreak and was presumptuously more successful than many other countries, especially Western countries. Uh, in containing the virus. So we do have different kind of developments and also, let's say, different parts of the world want to highlight different aspects of this kind of story, why we see in the West very much focus on the early outbreak and maybe the failure to kind of inform the rest of the world um, about the serious consequences. We do see that China tries to push the story more from a perspective of its successful Dealing with the with the virus, and additionally with uh, with its kind of help for countries in need, as we have seen, like in in Serbia, but also in Italy and and other parts of the world where where donations of medical supplies have been have been um, distributed. So in a way, um, just to get back to this, we especially out before the uh, COVID nineteen outbreak, we did see that uh, that. Um, the PRC became 
more and more active in and more and more assertive in, in showing its power position. And therefore it was was seen as uh, one of the uh, of the actors which is kind of um, filling the gap uh, which the United States left by retrieving its power from or reducing its power from from the region. The interesting part here is about um, about the um, close allies of uh, of the United States and their reaction to it. Um, so within the within Japan, we can see um, that there is of course a traditional since the end of the uh, the Second World War and uh, the U.S. Um, uh, um, and the, the new constitution, we do see a, a military constraint of, uh, of power, which is embedded in this constitution, in this uh, pacifist constitution. So we all know that uh, um, that Japan has some kind of military defense forces, but their their kind of mandate is limited, uh, and also their um, the capacity, uh, the, pos the possibility to ex for expansion is limited within a minute. Um, this was is not necessarily problematic, especially not in the light of uh, strong security guarantees uh, from the United States. But um, the current uh, Abe administration has already has risen uh, uh, doubts about. Uh, its willingness to continue in this way uh, several times, and also kind of with the uh, with the debate about the change of the constitution, um, uh, is fueling this idea that maybe um, Japan is kind of taking a different route, or, or at least is debating whether it should take a different route in the in the future. Um, another example which we could hear, use here is the the see the missile defense. Uh, hmm. Uh, um, um, theater, which um, has been seen very critical in China, but uh, recently actually has been announced to be discontinued. So we do have different kind of um, signals there as well from from the uh, Japanese position as well, and I will explore them in more detail um, a little later. So if we kind of talk about hotspots, what 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 kind of um, issues are really um, existent within the Proximity of uh, China and Japan, and where where are they? These countries involved in? Um, I mentioned already the Senkaku uh, Daesh um, uh, Island uh, in the um, Southeast China Sea. Uh, we mentioned uh, um, before that this is the the one territorial conflict which is kind of directly involving China and Japan. Of course, these um, these islands are um, are uninhabited, rather smallish, um, but at the same time, uh, they are, um, there are kind of sources for, uh, for, for their like um, energy sources, oil uh, resources seen beneath these, uh, this territory as well as uh, they are really important for fishery rights, etc. So there are some kind of um, value of these islands but it's not necessarily territory which is kind of um, conflicted with where, where the population is really involved. In um, so in the same way, there are two more conflicts where um, <clears throat> Japan and China are not directly involved, but which are really shaping um, the security structure within, within the region. And the one is Taiwan. So of course, China is directly involved in the conflict with Taiwan, but uh, Japan uh, not directly, at least outside of its role as a as a Western power. Um, so the the continuous threat uh, for the the de facto independent um, uh, existence of Taiwan um, has been has been escalated in, in in recent years more and more. That means that um, the People's Republic of China has uh, kind of asserted its claim that Taiwan is belonging uh, to China and is not independent and should not drive towards a more independent status. We have seen this in international organizations, including the World Health Organization, where China re rejected um, the participation of China, uh, Taiwan. We have seen this in more 
assertive um, military maneuvers by violating air, Taiwanese airspace and also um, um, uh, with, with flyovers, etc. So we do see an escalation of this uh, conflict um, in this way. Um, the most, maybe the most um, challenging um, conflict, of course, is North Korea within the region. So this is not directly involving Japan and not directly involving uh, China either. It's predominantly a conflict between uh, between North and South Korea and also North Korea and the United States. But Japan being a very close ally um, within uh, uh, with the United States, it has been continuously drawn into this conflict. And China has also a very strong stake in this conflict because it is the only presumable um, uh, ally of North Korea and is um, therefore, therefore, um, uh, and it's also worried about about kind of the change in leadership in North Korea could lead um, to a new security structure within the region, which it is un would be unhappy uh, to have. So this conflict is also involving both uh, both actors on opposite sides as well. Okay. Um, maybe. Okay, um, let me continue kind of talking about human security. So um, I introduced it already briefly by saying something about the role of, um, of infectious diseases like we had this COVID-19 and um, kind of introducing why this is a different security structure. Um, then the, our, our conflictual and national kind of security aspects which we have talked before. So I think one of the key issues about this is that it's not centered around nation states, but centered around humans, hence the name human security. Um, it is about pr uh, protecting individuals and really kind of thinking about them in as individuals in individual situations. So um, I think this is very intuitive to see it in a way uh, at a um, at issues like like fighting fighting a pandemic, um, it is not necessarily about each person um, um, or the, the nationality or the or any kind of ethnicity. Any of these kind of things are not necessarily very important in fighting a disease. And there's also not a real enemy which we can which we can fight in the way of a traditional warfare. Uh, but it is um, it's it has a serious impact on the individual security because these diseases are kind of spreading and have serious effects on your on your health. So in a way, um, the the logic is very different to approach those. So information is bec becoming very important. Uh, control is also becoming very important. But unlike um, a national conflict where we have a competition between different nation states. What we do have in, in issues of human security is that cooperation is becoming very important. The better you're capable of cooperating with, uh, with other actors, the more you're actually, the, the higher the likelihood that you will be able to deal with a certain, um, uh, with a certain um, pandemic or, or a certain, certain disease. Um, so in a way, the, the mechanism is becoming very different. And we do see this in other forms of human security as well. Environmental protection, for example, is another issue where we do see that, uh, that this level of cooperation is the key, key issue. Um, if you want to know more about the different kind of modes of operandi in this way, um, I highly recommend next year's class of international bargaining. We will talk a lot about the logic behind um, these kind of non-zero sum games. Um, but the one thing I want to say here is really that all of these issues, um, infectious diseases, environmental protection, migration, even drug trade, uh, counter-terrorism and, uh, and uh, human rights, 
are all kind of dealt with in in a mode of cooperation and information sharing rather in a in a competitive environment and so it's important to acknowledge this um, when dealing with issues like that um, so another interesting thing about um, pandemics and and, and natu natural kind of uh, uh, threats is that there are no enemies so what we do have in 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 um, traditional uh, situations of, of of conflict and and the security threats is that there is an enemy ex um, existing or an opponent existing and this opponent is an actor as well which can act in a one way or another so this um these kind of um situations are are easier to control because uh, the enemy is known and the enemy can be engaged with um, what we do see um is that we have more and more non-traditional what is called non-traditional threats where there's not a clear enemy or no enemy at all so this can be of course um, um, diseases but also environmental issues etc because natural events don't don't um, can't, can't be counted as enemy because you can't reckon with them in the same way um, you would reckon with an opponent but also non-state actors are becoming much more uh, difficult to deal with. So if we kind of think about counterterrorism or X, um, that's also um, makes it an, a traditional uh, security structure obsolete because um, the distinction between uh, a friend and enemy is becoming much more difficult in these situations. Uh, so in a way, often these these forms of threats are across international borders. So we can't kind of keep that international border as a security me a mechanism for um, shielding up uh, um, against certain threats. So one of the aspects, and probably a right kind of strategy, to slow down the the, the um, expansion of the virus was to close the border. Yeah, but we do know that that doesn't really lead to a situation of um, um, uh, where where the the um, uh, the, the situation where where the where the virus could be curbed with just by closing the borders. It was still kind of once it is prevalent in one country, uh, it will continue to be be existent in there. Um, and um, so it is one of the measurements which is important, but not necessarily the most effective one. And international cooperation becomes the key kind of aspect there. So this is just like a little, I don't want to go into too much detail, this is just a little comparative uh, level of um, comparing inter the traditional security aspects to human security aspects. So in traditional security aspects, we have the state, we have the national security as the kind of the nucleus, the core of it. We have structured violence or violence from actor A to actor B, and it's in a competitive kind of environment so that the countries compete over, over this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, within this conflict and try to, if one becomes weaker, the other becomes automatically stronger and vice versa. So it is all about relative gains in terms of uh, in interaction with your opponent, never about absolute gains. Human security in this way is very different. It's not about the state, it's about the individual or maybe the community where this individual is living in. So it's about the security about the, uh, of the society, of the individual people, not the nation in itself. It's actually really about um, what I said before, about people's focus, not nation focus. Often the violence and or the, the if we kind of think about it in terms of a disease, um, this is unstructured and chaotic. So it is not something which we know, predict, uh, be able to predict where it is exactly coming from. And we can also include here um, uh, terrorism in this in this thing. There is also kind of not clear where the threats are actually coming from. Um, the best way to deal with it is not competition, but rather cooperation. Um, and it's all about what is called absolute gain. So any kind of better curb with 
dealing, for example, with, with a virus uh, by having a vaccine is benefiting the whole world. It's not just uh, benefiting one country, or it should at least not, but it's rather kind of um, um, a benefit for, the, um, for all the actors. And so we are talking here about absolute gains rather than relative gains. Well, let me talk, if we kind of talk about this kind of uh, cooperation between actors, I want to make a little bit of a shift from this kind of more, more abstract forms of human versus national security and kind of talk a little bit about the, the current status of cooperation between the China, People's Republic of China and uh, Japan. And what we see in this kind of interesting triangle between Washington, Tokyo, and Beijing. In a way, um, there is a strong cooperation, uh, especially economically, between Japan and China. But in a way, again, uh, the third actor within the region is often seen as more important. So the relationship between Japan and China is always if on both sides seen as second rated with the relationship with the United States. Japan, of course, is heavily relying on, uh, on the United States as its security guarantor and its very close ally. And therefore, this kind of relationship, retaining the relationship between, uh, a positive relationship between the United States and Japan is seen as the most important aspect. Again, from the perspective of China, this is also interesting because um, the relationship with the United States as a comp uh, competitor is seen as more important than the relationship with Japan. So in this way, it often, um, often Japan is only seen as, a, as an add-on um, to uh, the United States. And the conflict between the China and the United States is shadowing over relationships with, uh, with Japan as well. So we can see this as the current um, uh, kind of um, uh, trade war between the United States and China. We do see that, um, that conflictual behavior towards um, Japan is increasing by China as well. Uh, at the same time, um, Japan feels obliged to follow the strategy of the United States in order to be seen as a, um, as a, um, as a, um, be, continue to be seen as a close ally um, to the United States, even though it might uh, actually kind of use a different strategy towards China than the ch strategy chosen by the United States. Um, however, as we see been, uh, a little later, is that as a trading partner, especially for Japan, uh, the, uh, China is very, very important. And so Japan has a vital interest in continuous development and stability within, uh, within China. So it is a little bit of a, of a um, uh, for Japan, it's a situation where it is in between uh, the different, it, at the one hand, it wants to be close to the policy decisions of its, of its close ally, the United States. It also has um, some territorial and other historical conflict with China. But at the same time, from a trade perspective, China is very important, and therefore stability is also seen as really important. So, just to give you a couple of uh, um, of, of um, charts here, what we can see is that since 2005 to 2017, we do have seen an increase in exports as well as imports. There are some fluctuation of it, um, but interestingly the trade balance is becoming more and more stronger in terms of imports from China uh, towards exports uh, to China. So what we can see is like um, <clears throat> um, in, the, in around 2010, we had like a more balanced import-export uh, 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 trade balance between the two actors and it becomes stronger and stronger in favor of imports from China um, versus exports towards China. So that means that also the, um, Japan is heavily relying on goods of which are coming from uh, China, and therefore it's also kind of not 
of from an economic perspective, it is not beneficial for Japan to have increased escalation of a conflictuous behavior between Japan and China. In, especially in the light of the current pandemic, this, this kind of dependency has been noticed more widely and uh, the government is trying to implement a, uh, a policies which move, um, which move uh, kind of decrease this dependency and move away imports to other Southeast Asian countries, especially Vietnam, uh, the Philippines and also Thailand are kind of uh, promoted in this way, uh, Malaysia as well. <clears throat> But um, this is at best a long-term strategy and will not have um, um, any kind of consequences in the near future. So this kind of dependence on, the, on China and the Chinese products is a continue to be existent in China, Japan. To highlight this a bit further, if we kind of look at the trade partners in 2019, uh, we see that China has, is Japan's largest source of import. All, uh, from all um, partners, including the United States. So if you see like in terms of exports, China has 19.2% of Japanese exports. The US had 19.35%, South Korea 7%. But in terms of, so US and China are more or less on equal terms here. But if we look at imports, we do see that imports from China is 24.5%. The next biggest one is again the United States but with 11% less than half of that, what uh, the imports of, um, of China. And Australia is coming as a, in as a third with merely 5.8%. So, so in a way together, China and Hong Kong became the largest trading partner. And already in 2004, it surpassed the United States. So while politically the United States is the most important um, partner um, for Japan, this is not necessarily true on an economic level. And on an economic level, China has, be, has continuously become more and more important and in sources of, of especially imports, um, uh, Japan is heavily depending on, on, Japan, uh, on China. Interesting also, if we look at the foreign direct investment of China, Japanese companies in uh, in the uh, in the region, we can uh, now in China we can see that um, except Hong Kong, which is of course the biggest uh, foreign direct investment in mainland China, that the second uh, biggest is already Japan with seven percent, followed by Singapore. Um, the United States is only has only three percent of foreign direct investment. Germany, UK, only one percent. Um, South Korea, 3%. So Japan as a, sub, uh, a substantial part of the market uh, and is really important uh, in this. And estimated that um, it, the, the value of this direct investment is around 66 billion uh, US dollar and may more or less 1 million Japanese employees are depending on it. Um, Here, this is to highlight actually a very similar point, um, but looking at it over a long periods of time. What we could see is that um, the uh, direct investment of, um, of the United States since the 1980s, uh, the United States and Japan in the, since the 1980s up to 2013 in China. So we can kind of have a comparison of these two actions. And what we do see is that they have been re rising on the um, relatively similar to each other, but in the end of the 1990s, there has been a lot of um, foreign direct investment from the United States to a lesser extent um, from Japan. But since then, since the, the beginning of this uh, millennium, um, Japan has uh, has um, overshadowed investment of the United States within Japan, uh, within China um, continuously. And uh, in, the, in recent years, this has been, this kind of trend has been 
um, increased even further. So we see now much more direct investment, uh, Japanese foreign direct investment in China in comparison to US foreign direct investment. So this has been the economic uh, kind of uh, trend. What we do see here is that the interdependence between China and uh, Japan is relatively high. We do have lots of um, uh, we do have lots of um, economic uh, cooperation, lots of trade, and high levels of dependency on on, on both sides of the market. And I want to kind of see what are the current um, uh, political issues from the two kind of perspectives. And uh, we mentioned them already before, but I want to kind of collect them, so to speak, on maybe one page. And what we do see here is that that the one, the most concerning issue for Japan um, of, uh, China, uh, of uh, the actions of China is on one hand, the increased power of China, which is seen as a more, more abstract level that it becomes challenging for Japan's position within the region because um, the worry is that China will be able to over, overshadow the, um, the Japanese position within the region. But more concretely, what we do see is that within the, the uh, what is seen as a worry within, within Japan is that China is becoming more aggressive in territorial disputes. This is not just true in, in the respect of, uh, to, to Japan, but more generally in, um, in, in, within the South China Sea, but also, um, with, with respect of the, uh, two countries, one state action in Hong Kong, um, with the conflict with, um, uh, with Taiwan, and even in a conflict between, uh, over, over some regions in the Himalaya between India and, uh, China, we do see a more, aggressive stance of China on territorial issues. And the escalation of the, of the conflict over Singapore Islands has also been kind of uh, led to like the Japanese claim that there has been a systematic violation of, of territorial rights um, and um, uh, by, by a Chinese military. Um, so which kind of led to an to increase the aggression between both countries. Um, so Japanese would claim uh, that, uh, that China is not interested in multilateral cooperation within the region uh, or over the Singapore Islands, Daesh, Daesh and the Singapore Islands. And also that it kind of tries to revise existing positions by force. Um, the Chinese perspective is quite different, actually. Um, at the one hand, it's also uh, focusing on the unresolved Singapore Daesh uh, island conflict, seeing it rather as a as an exploitation from the Japanese side, as um, that these these islands have been taken at a position when, like at the time when China was very weak and divided, and therefore couldn't really kind of. Um, uh, assert its uh, regional, like territorial rights. Um, this is not the claim which is only done against uh, uh, Japan. This is done a claim which has been uh, kind of used against uh, over all these disputed areas uh, within the South um, China Sea as well, towards um, uh, towards the Philippines and Vietnam, um, identically to to to. In the, in the same way as towards uh, Japan. But the situation of Japan was also quite different because of the, um, the, uh, the historic situation uh, around the, um, the Second World War. I think they're kind of, what we have to mention here is especially the, the Nanjing massacre, which has been in the eyes of the Chinese never, um, there has never been a kind of a, a credible formal apology by Japan. And so this is seen as a, as a sore point in history, so to speak, um, from, from the Chinese perspective. Um, so there has been a, a kind of, uh, the aggression uh, has been recognized in, in 1990. 
98 from Japan for the first time. Um, but um, certain actions um, question uh, Chinese uh, or, or questioned by Chinese is not uh, not is being taken to uh, to sincere. The one maybe two with which I want to briefly uh, um, mention is the the, the continuous. Um, um, the, the the existence and the the, the, the praise of um, of people at this Yasukuni uh, shrine as being seen as a sore point as well, or a, like a like a provocation um, by the Chinese. Another thing is the um, is the we the the, um, the continuous um, description of of the, the the situation surrounding the Second World War and the and the, the atrocities done by Japanese military uh, within the Second World War by uh, by um, uh, Japanese uh, historic uh, textbooks and, and classroom books, which have been revised in in recent years. This has been seen as critical uh, by. By, um, the, um, by the Chinese government as well. Um, so the question here is, is um, so we do have like a certain level of conflict and conflictual behavior, um, which has been, these tensions have been building up from both sides, Japan and China. But at the same time, as I said before, the relationship of both of these actors towards the United States seem to be more important than the relationship between the countries itself. Um, so I think this it is we can the relationship between China and Japan can only be understood if we kind of see it in this uh, as a triangular relationship, including the United States. At the same time, we do see a structural change, and especially on the economic side, a higher dependence on on each other. Uh, like on both like China dependence on on Japan and Japan's dependence on China has been increasing considerably in the last 20 to 30 years. And so my question here for you at the end is really like, um, will, um, will, what will the, the future cooperation um, be? And how can we kind of, um, what, what kind of expectations do you have of the relationship? If we kind of think about this in terms of fear, we can see that China will maybe is worried that Japan will become a military power in the region again, and therefore kind of become a competitor. And in, in, in this may, might actually lead to a to an arms a, a, a regional arms race between the two actors. Um, Japan's worry might very well be that it's um, that China becomes an increasing military threat for Japan uh, and the other countries in the region, and therefore it's actually kind of forced to build up its military. Um, but in a way, kind of what I really would like to know is that whether the countries will find a way for political cooperation between them, or whether all of these kind of cooperation is kind of is bound in this triangular situation between the United States, Japan, and China. So I will conclude um, this this um, this lecture with um, with a discussion question, um, which I hope you can write something on our Padlet site. So please take some time uh, to write it down. So the question is really like, uh, how do you think the future relationship between China and Japan will develop in the next ten to twenty years? Do you think it will be become increasingly cooperative? or rather conflictual, and what are your reasons to think so? So down here is the link uh, to our Padlet site. Um, please write down any thoughts you have on this, um, on this topic. I'm looking very much forward to um, reading them. And I also look very much forward to um, seeing you uh, in, in our class this week and to discuss um, this topic, I think, the the current uh, international dynamic as well as um, the proximity of China towards Japan where we are uh, all living is making it very interesting and I hope we will have a very good discussion on it. So until then, thank
take care and goodbye. <laughs>